But in the digital world, impressions were second class citizens. The aim was the click. And so you paid to get impressions, but at a really, really low rate, fractions of a cent most of the time. Yep. So impressions were kind of the undercurrent because to get a click, you had to have an impression, but they wanted a small amount of money for an impression, but that was it. And we realized that if we made the world's least attractive ad, that literally, if it said don't click yeah. here, the bastards would click, you know, oh, got to click on it. It couldn't say don't. It just had to make you not want to. Oh, black and white. It looked so amateurish. It was completely uninviting. And we bid low. We wanted no impressions whatsoever. And we found for an amazingly small amount of money, we were getting up to half a million hits per day on impressions. And this was manna from heaven. All of a sudden, the ad was everywhere. You're listening to Ping, a podcast by AP, discussing all things related to measuring the internet. I'm your host, George Michaels. This time, I'm talking to Jeff Houston from APNIC Labs in his regular monthly spot on Ping. Jeff and I discussed the APNIC Labs advertising-based measurement system. I have some insight into how this emerged as I worked on the design and deployment of early versions of this system with Jeff and with Byron Ellicott. This work has been massively updated and carried forward by Jeff and Joao Damas and now encompasses far more nodes, more users, and can measure more aspects of the internet protocol suite than we imagined possible back in 2011. Hello, Jeff. Welcome back. Good something, George. I guess it's afternoon where I am. Uh, who knows? But yes, no, it's really good to be back here with you as well. And uh, hello, everyone. Yes, hi. What should we talk about this time? Well, I actually wanted to talk about, I suppose, one of the core things we do this time around, George, because while I sort of poke my nose into all kinds of weird bits and pieces around the internet and weird behaviours, at heart, I think I'm a measurement guy. And, uh, oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of measurement, and uh, I wanted to actually talk about some of the uh, the core platform I actually use in the work that I do about measuring certain parts of the internet and the approach to measurement that we use and the kinds of things we can do and can't do about this, because I think it's interesting. I think it's fascinating, and I think this is exactly what people want to hear about. I should probably say at this point that I have some prior knowledge, declaration of interest, because I helped you with some of the early instantiations of this, but the modern state of this advertising platform is wildly different to the one I remember. So let's wind the clock back, Jeff. Let's go back to 2010 and those heady days when people thought the way to measure the network was to measure yourself and look in your own web logs. Do you remember those days? Okay, so I want to put this into context because around 2008, and that was actually just after Apple released the iPhone. And I think our listeners are all old enough that they can probably remember their first iPhone as distinct from something from Nokia or Motorola, which was really, really a phone, when Apple released this thing that was a happy little computer in your pocket. And all of a sudden, everyone wanted one. Now, yeah. we were handing out addresses or, you know, one here, one there. And they were going to last for some time because there was no great pressure. All of a sudden, Apple come along. They didn't tell anyone. They didn't warn anyone. But folk were buying them in their millions a week. Yeah. These devices consumed IP addresses as soon as Absolutely. you turned them on. They were internet devices. They weren't really phones. Oh, you could speak into it. How amusing. But all of a sudden, the device population on the internet just went kaboom. Now, yeah. we had done the work about we're running out of IP addresses yeah. about 20 years before that. We'd actually forgotten most of it. The yeah. theory was that 
before we gave away the last V4 address, we better have jumped into something because when you run out of addresses in a computer network, what do you use to number the next computer? If you yeah. haven't got an address, it's kind of, well, I'm sorry, we're full. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Not good. Those early projections on address consumption that actually put quite a wide date range of risk on this. They projected sometime 2005, 2007, possibly up to 2008, 2009, was their candidate for when things might get difficult. Well, well, actually, before the mobile phone, we had instituted in the regional internet routing area, sorry, not routing, but the regional internet community, we'd put forward pretty harsh policies around conservation. Yeah. We were trying to back this off. Which had brought things back into right. line. And, and the addresses were going to last until 2030, 2040. What, yep. me worry? It just wasn't a problem until Apple changed everything. Yep. And the assault on the address space, and I can only call it that because these things just sold, meant that exhaustion was a now problem, not a 2030 problem. Yeah. And the answer was, of course, we all said to ourselves, the answer is IPv6. Yes. And we better be running IPv6 before we run out of addresses. So yep. that gave us two measurement questions. Who <laughs> and how <laughs> yeah, much? That's right. When are we going to run out? When do we need to be running v6 by? It was basically, it wasn't a run yeah. out question. It was, by what date should the v6 network be primed and ready to take over? Because when we run out of v4, we're going to hit the wall and just die, 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 die. So around this time, Jeff, I was in a role of technical management in APNIC, and we faced this question as a service delivery question from people in the policy setting space. And we all, I don't think I was alone in this, I think lots of people in the, quote, measurement community, we all made the assumption I'm average, let's measure us. And we started to promote figures about relative V6 usage and numbers of members who could use V6 based on our own web logs. And I remember you having a really quite direct and trenchant criticism of this methodology. And if my memory is right, the foundational point was the people that come to APNIC right. sit at the centre of their own you see, network. see, that was the second part of the two questions we had. The first question was, when do we need V6 by? When's this stuff going to run out? The when question. And I had done a huge amount of work in modeling exhaustion. So we're not talking about modeling exhaustion today, but oh my God, advanced stats, modeling techniques, statistical, uh, you know. Yep. Uh, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo methods. I'd gone through a huge amount of work and I was relatively confident, even after the mobile phone assault, about when we needed to do something. But there was this other question, because before we ran out, before, not after, we had to have V6 everywhere. And the real question was, okay, that means the date's important. What's the starting point today? So yep. in 2006, how much V6 is out there? 2007, when we were still looking at this, if we've got five years, if we've got six years, how big will the network be? in 2012 or whenever it is, and where are we starting from? Yeah. How much V6 do we have right now? How big is the task we've got? So people drove to what they had, weblogs, and the other thing they had, BGP. And we'd all make statements saying, oh, there must be 50% IPv6 in Asia because we can see 50% of the enhanced routes in BGP of V6. Well, or we'd say 20% of the web traffic to APNIC from our members is V6. Therefore, V6 uptake must be 20%. And, oh, hindsight, how naive we were. Well, there's no shortage of folk willing to prognosticate when you want prognostications. Time immemorial, folk have been, you know, making wild shots and all that kind of stuff and guessing like crazy. And it was quite irritating in some ways to see these really wacko guesses. And everyone kind of looked under their armpits or whatever they were doing around their world and said, I see this much, I see this much V6, I can smell it, you know, it's <laughs> in here somewhere, sniff, sniff. And the numbers were bizarrely variable. Yeah. And a number of us at the time, including, I think, an effort that was orchestrated by ISOC, were trying to sort of understand what each of us were seeing 
and to try and get some levels set on yeah. not even the exhaustion date, but just where are we coming from? How much is out there? Yeah. And and the first sort of phase, as you pointed out, is look around you and whatever you see, use. And so I was collecting BGP routing tables. So obviously you collect the V6 BGP routing table and you find some routes. Not a lot. Not a lot. And, and there's this emerging suspicion, even from that little data, that the V6 story was more about hot air and less about action. And so we started doing the next thing because most of us at the time had access to a web page or two. Yep. APNIC did. And the first thing I did was, was basically deface it. Yep. <laughs> With your cooperation, might I add, as I plead yes, guilty to doing fully this. fully cooperated. I remember we'd all seen Kame, the website for Kame.net, that stack of IPv6 that had been written by Itogen in the WIDE project that provided BSD IPv6. If you went to the web page on 6... Right, the dancing turtle. You got a dancing turtle. And that led quite naturally to the idea of a traffic light. If you came on four, it was going to be red. If you came on six, it was going to be green. And if you could come on either, put it in amber, say. Well, and the idea was if you made this page really popular, because everyone wants to see dancing turtles, don't they? Then yep. what you record yep. is a window of what the world is. Because obviously every web page sees a cross section of the entire world's traffic. Yeah, right. And so yeah. we went and defaced the AP Nick web page and actually put a little we reached out to a number of other people saying please can we deface your website and <laughs> so this was the first sort of phase and, and at the time the web was becoming armed armed and dangerous yeah that it was no longer just a bunch of text a bit of html and a few pretty pickies it wasn't even moving images it was actually some coding because you could either code it in JavaScript, I think was the name at the time. It's what we call HTML5. Very early days. Yep. Yeah. And the other one was, of course, you could go down the Adobe path with whatever their scripting language. Flash. Flash, that's right, Adobe Flash. And various yep. sites used various engines. But the whole idea was there was a lot more going on in the web page than you thought, and you thought you were just visiting some URL, and they were busy going, hmm, who are you? Let's have some little traffic that no one else can see. Hi, can you do this? Can you do that? So we did that. And it's actually surprisingly easy. The first one was, what's your IP address? Because we were advertising V4 and V6, which way did you come? And that was it. Yep. And interestingly, AP Nick saw back in, geez, I think it was about 2008, 2009, a number that was around 5%. And we looked around at a few other folk, and I think at the time, Google hadn't done it. Jason Fesler had set up a page, and his number was yep. actually a bit lower than that. And we were trying to wonder, why are we seeing differences? It's concerning when a fundamental property like this, did you use six, did you use four, is so variant. That starts to make alarm bells go off. It's more... If we've got to do this massive change across the entire internet to forklift in V6, and we're going to spend more than a dollar, a lot, lot more than a dollar to do this, this goes deep down into business. The iPhone, for all the success and all the millions of units, V4 only, not even V6 within QE at the time. Yeah. And you sort of sit there and go, wow, this is a serious problem. If we really need to do the change, we need to understand how big the problem is, where the problem is, and start actually informing yep. the work from solid data. So around this time, I think we first got sight of a library to do this test that Emil Arben had written at the RIPE NCC, and we were able to share that and start doing some development work in that. I borrowed some stuff also from Jason Fesler, yep. and there was, I think there was even some Comcast code. It might have come from John Brzezowski. Yep. We were cooperating with each other. I think we all wanted to kind of uncover this yep. and try to sort of instrument some self-contained, pretty small code that just silently ran in the background of a web page that went, oh, you know, can you do six? And we changed it a little bit on the way and started to look a little deeper into 
probing, not just looking. Yeah. In other words, when you're here to sort of sort the sheep from the goats, to sort the automated web caches from anything else, to try and get a real feel, we started to sort of go active. But I have to say one thing, though, just at this point about the problem that we had. AP Nick is a wonderful bunch of people. Oh, lovely. They're geek intense, and in the scale of billions of users, they're microscopically small. Yes. So this central problem that the sample set was self-selecting, it was techs who sat at the heart of their own network, and it was not representative of these new, handheld, highly mobile, widely deployed devices that were burning the addresses. They weren't sitting it behind a phone. And most of them had decided they were going to do V6 in their little self-contained area of bubble. And it was yep. kind of, we were seeing the wrong picture. We were just self-deluding. Yep. I remember we tried to form a relationship with some people like Wikimedia to see if we could include the measurement that, that was in, in a more popular right. site. If APNIC is such a, a distorted website, and it is, are there better ones? Yeah. We started doing two things. We started trying to enlist some people, say, we have this little bit of JavaScript. Can you put it on your web page? Please, please. We scored a success with the university superannuation page. I was going to come into that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, uni super. We had success in, with the Air New Zealand at the time. Thank you. And we had some inadvertent success because some very helpful person who was on a contract to Bloomberg, put out a little wow. bit of JavaScript on Bloomberg. Yeah. And we were getting, you know, 100 hits a day, 200 hits a day, and, and the time. Which, compared to other sources of sample, was actually pretty good. Well, we thought pretty pleased about that until Bloomberg came along, and within 24 hours, yeah. every piece of silicon near us had melted. There are a lot of people yeah. that read Bloomberg, and they were all busy sending back their answers invisibly to us. We go, oh, my God, please, no. And Bloomberg, I think, had got in a, did we have that on our webpage? We're terribly sorry. And, you know, we all yeah. backed off. But it gave us a new view. Yeah. And the, the dawning realization was, if you don't want to be self-deluded, you need to go big, really big. Yeah. And you need to be on an asset that is effectively the website that any random person in the community at large is likely to to go to. Right. You don't and want to be on your site. You want to be on something much more general. And this is the days before content data networks really took off. So although there was indeed Akamai and a few others there, they weren't in our sites. No. We kind of looked at www.google.com. That would be awesome. Now, the problem is, of course, and it's not really a problem, I can quite understand, that Google says, well, that's our property and, you know, it's our data. Mm. We're not going to share that and we're not going to put your JavaScript on our site. And you kind of go, oh, yeah, right. So how can we act like Google was then the new conversation? How can we get the kind of reach that this highly popular website that everyone was going to without being them, without actually being them? And that was a bit of a discussion. Because we're trying to figure out how to scale this up. And at this point, our mutual colleague, Byron Ellicott, came up with the world's wackiest idea. Because, of course, we all knew, and by this time, ads were everywhere. Once Google had bought DoubleClick and they started applying the yeah. Turbo Rocket Booster set to DoubleClick, ads were just firing it. And ads were actually financing everything. So ads were everywhere. And love them or hate them, you couldn't avoid them. Byron pointed out that in behind the ad was an image, you know, a pretty picture, and some flash, and some code. And in fact, as soon as the ad was placed onto some user's browser, didn't have to click, didn't have to do anything, the browser went, aha, I see some code to execute, and just jumped in and ran it. So this is a door opening to a step function in scaling and removing the active component. So before this point, you have a thing that says, please click here to tell us if you can use V6. Right, you have to click, click the measurement. Yeah. And 99% of the people are going to go, I haven't got time for that, and pass it by. And you only attract a dedicated few to actively engage with you to come and see if they can do six. So when you move to advertising and flash, no active engagement. It's just happening. Advertisers 
want you to click on the ad. That's the feedback. And so the way the advertising networks work is that the advertiser tells the advertising agency, double click, the kind of demographics they want. But then the agency kind of has a problem. Up comes a browser, up comes a person with a profile. Which ad do you display? Now, this was, I suppose, the genius of double click, and it was genius. They conducted an auction, like a fish market. Here's this chunky bit of tuna. Who's going to pay the most? Here's this. Yep, here's this hunky user. And hunky bit of user, not freshly frozen. <laughs> not freshly frozen. I'm, I'm selling them to you. <laughs> Their eyeballs are being sold to you. That's right. Who's going to bid the most? So they were actually trying to get money from clicks. Who's willing to pay the most for a click? And clicks are hideously expensive. I think the automotive industry in the US, the bidding price a couple of years ago, was 50 bucks a click. Pool cleaning suppliers, similarly outrageous. Yeah. And we looked at this and thought, hang on a second. But what about impressions? Which always existed underneath because advertising impressions yes. was the prior mode that the newspapers used. There was no click in the days of newspaper advertising. It was, if they turn the page, they will see your ad. How much will you pay me for them to see it? So impressions was a model that had existed from time immemorial. But in the digital world, impressions were second-class citizens. The aim was the click. And so... You paid to get impressions, but at a really, really low rate, fractions of a cent most of the time. Yep. So impressions were kind of the undercurrent because to get a click, you had to have an impression, but they wanted a small amount of money for an impression, but that was it. And we realized that if we made the world's least attractive ad, that literally, if it said, don't click yep. here, the bastards would click, you know, oh, got to click on this. But if we made it, it couldn't say don't, it just had to make you not want to. Oh, black and white. It looked so amateurish. It was completely uninviting. And we bid low. We wanted no impressions whatsoever. And we found for an amazingly small amount of money, we were getting up to half a million hits per day on impressions. And this was manna from heaven. All of a sudden, the ad was everywhere. My memory of this time, because I worked with Byron on lodging these ads and in managing a little bit of the ad process, my memory is that there's this rather weird dynamic that happens in advert display. When you have a new advert, the company that's doing the placement wants to see if it can get you out there. So it initially puts quite a lot of energy into making your I can get visible. into that reverse engineering. And yes, I think all three of us spent quite some time reverse engineering the algorithm. There's this other thing that at the end of the day, at the end of an hour of bidding, when everyone's paid lots of money to be the first ad of choice, there's 15 minutes left that they desperately want to fill and no one's bidding for clicks. So, You're right. so people like AP Nick, who were buying the impressions, are suddenly, oh, well, that's $5 I'm going to get for a low effort. AP Nick, you're wrong. What was going on is that when you sort of talk to Google, or at least double click about being an advertiser, you do a bid per user on impressions. You do a bid for clicks, really low because we're not going to pay for clicks. But there's this other bit where you say, here's my budget for the day. You will not bill me more than this budget. But you can bill me up to this budget. Up to this amount of money. You know, it's up to you, but I'm going to bid half a cent per impression two cents per click or half a cent per click. I really don't want clicks. And the money I've got today is 50 bucks. Do your damnedest. And Google go, or double click, challenge accepted. At the end of 24 hours, I will have spent 50 bucks of your money. Not 49, no money left on the table. Yeah. And so this is, a, is not a manual system. This is completely automated. And they have a big network folk watch YouTube everywhere, we noticed very quickly on. And so the real question was, how do we put your ad in with all the rest? And so we noticed the first time or the first few days the ad ran, it's going, oh, I want to maximize my return. So I'm going to try and get as many clicks as I can from this ad. So I'm going to make you the premier Uno number one ad on high rotation and they spent our money inside of half an hour. Blah, 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 blah. That was the ad. 
just to see how much clicks would happen. Which was zero. <laughs> we got no clicks. It's a boring ad. It was never going to work. But they kind of go, all oh, right. And then they started going, well, let's not peak that high. Let's flatten it out a bit and run the ad for two hours, three hours, and then kind of come down and calm down. And after about a week and a half, it would sort of sort itself out. Yeah. Sort of. It starts early. It tries to make all the money it can out of you by about the 20th or 21st hour in the day. So Google always gives itself a couple of hours just in case it got it wrong. So if there's still money left in my pocket, <laughs> let me just drain it by the time the day ends. Now, I'll finish this story before I move back onto where we were, because I think it was kind of amusing. We shared the technique with some very, very bright students at the um, French, the Parisian Ecole Polytechnique under Mark Townsley. And these guys, who are, again, infinitely clever, said, you know, you've still got a 24-hour diurnal cycle. We can fix this. Instead of doing one advertising cycle for 24 hours, we're going to have 12 cycles each of two hours duration. And so poor old DoubleClick has just two hours to make yeah. the money. And if you divide it that way, the ad swings around the world yeah. because when someone's sleeping and they've still got to make the money in that two-hour slot, your ad moves across to Europe, across to America, across to Asia, and it follows the people. My memory is that we wound up taking that basic model, which was brilliant, and actually running an interleave of maybe a two or three hour window with overlaps, so that in effect, we were doing a combination of successive waves of ads, which meant we got an overall flatter picture from the swings and peaks and valleys of each individual ad moving through its life cycle. It was quite a complicated system to keep going at that point. Our ad placement manual intelligence was interacting with their wholly automated, yeah. <laughs> automatic intelligence. The outcome was pretty damn impressive. And, and therefore, we'd actually managed to get a smoothing across that 24-hour cycle. And literally, we saw everywhere. Now, before we come to what can be measured, there's just one more quality in this, which I think we'll probably come back to later on, which is the distortion of finding cheap places to show ads and oh. the compensation that necessarily stems from that. Because you may wind up during the midnight hours in America, but with people awake in Egypt. And although you might think it's the natural time to measure in America, it could turn out that what happens is thousands of impressions get shown in Egypt. So, yes, there was this other part of, of the issue about advertising bias. You see, we wanted to see everywhere, literally everywhere. But there are some eyeballs which are, if you will, richer eyeballs. And Google would rather give them an ad about car insurance or pool cleaning equipment and some weird ad that no one clicks about, about AP Nick and measurement or whatever, was never going to get shown. So we somehow needed to, A, try and change that, but B, compensate for the things that we just couldn't fix. So... In some ways, what we had, what we found was that sort of countries with a lower GDP per capita tended to get a higher proportion of our ads because we were bidding low, and countries which were richer, our ads were being displayed less. And when you start making judgments about, well, all the world is doing X, yeah. what you're really saying is there's a whole bunch of people in Egypt and Algeria that's doing X, and I'm not sure what's going on in America because the ad didn't really display that much. That's an extreme. That's the extreme. But the reality underlying this is that by the stage that came to the surface, the count of impressions a day was heading up to the hundreds of thousands. And so although there might be 20,000 from Egypt, there were still 5,000 from America, which by comparison with 100 a day is a pretty good sample. It's not that the sample size wasn't big. The point is the relativities were completely out of whack. Well, we'd gone big. We'd gone big. We'd gone into, I think, five to six million impressions a day. And all of a sudden, too, we needed to make a whole bunch of changes because we were running this stuff out of Brisbane, Australia, and saying to the good folk in Greenland, here's this place in Brisbane, Australia. Send us a packet. 
And we weren't quite sure if their inability to send us something was due to the fact that it's a long way, no matter what, between Greenland and Brisbane, Australia, and a lot of delay, a lot of everything, or it just didn't work. And so we got did the next part of this work, which was instead of everyone going to our server, we found a really good crowd of folk who did virtual servers in the cloud and found a location in Europe, uh, a location in America, uh, a location in Asia. And we kind of said, where are you? IP address, geolocation, yeah, we can get you to a continent pretty easily no matter what. Let's direct you to talk to our node in Singapore, which is closer to you, or our node in Europe and so on, and started to try and divide the world up to get better performance across that area. So this is quite an interesting moment, because if anyone who is listening to this works in the modern domain of CDNs, in Fastly or Akamai or Cloudflare, or even in some smaller instance that does distribution, you'd be sitting there going, yeah, that's like blindingly obvious. But you do have to go back, essentially, somewhere around 10 years. We, in effect, came up with a model for how to do geolocation to the granularity of a continent that could be done pretty much with one lookup. You and I had a conversation, I remember, about the routing table at that stage being 300,000 entries. But if you compressed it down to which continent am I on, it was really only about 15,000 entries in a table. Well, we'd managed to get the geolocation down to a fine art. Uh, folk have done much better since, and that, that's fine. But, you know, this uncovering of issues around if you're trying to measure everyone and you're trying to have it on the basis of a conversation with the server, then if the server is in one location, the folk far away have a different conversation to the folk nearby, and the way to correct that bias is lots of servers. Now, we didn't have infinite money, so we settled on three, sort of one per continent, and then sort of slowly built that up little by little. But the whole idea was to try and get the experience uniform so the answers were kind of uniformly valid. So that it was as close as possible to the local experience. Because within reason, if you could reach a node in Central Europe from anywhere in the circuit of Europe, that was pretty good. Right. So then we started comparing our measurements. Now, it wasn't 10% of V6. It wasn't 20%. It wasn't anything like that. It was low. It was, at the time, really very, very low. But others were also doing the measurement. And the one that really attracted our attention was that we were moaning that we couldn't get hold of Google's web page and do the measurement. And I think some folk in Google, namely Lorenzo Caliti and uh, Eric Klein, were listening and said, we can because <laughs> we work for them. Let's do measurements on Google doing a one in end sampling and reporting. And it was kind of curious, George, because their number was higher than ours. And we're kind of thinking, yeah. but it's kind of the same. It's apples and apples. It's not vastly different. Yeah. Why are you seeing more V6 than we are? What are we doing wrong? And then we got into this large area of what's the underlying sort of theory behind ads and even the theory behind folk who visit Google. And this is this part of the world is not the same. Now, in today's population, how many folk live in China and India? And the answer is around 2 billion, roughly. Yeah, and pretty much. In particular, with Google, they do not see as Google.com Chinese users. They just don't. Yep. And so a measurement made from the Google web platform is kind of missing out on a large hunk of users who at the time, at the time, might I stress, were not doing V6, whereas ads – truly are <laughs> ubiquitous. And although the Google web yes. page wasn't visible in China, games with ads and ads coming from DoubleClick is kind yes. of a worldwide currency. Everyone sees ads. And we were seeing... So that is, in effect, another division of Google. It wasn't the assets in Google that Google researchers could put right. tests on. Whereas we were. And in some ways, that kind of exposed this issue that... You know, you've really got to correct for the bias of ad placement. Yeah. Correct for it. So then we went down a long, a long area trying to find what's a reliable source of the truth about the density of users 
Very few. Very few. About the only one we could find were the lies that governments tell us. The official census of internet users per country, published by that august institution, the ITUT, their stats area. So these might be misleading in as much as people would have some desire to inflate, but they were very unlikely to underrepresent because these things were ultimately going to be informing things like shareholder reports. There's a certain meeting point of lies and truth here where money needs to know. Well, also, when you're drowning, anything that floats looks good. This was the only data out there. And for all of its failings and for all of its kind of, is that really real? It's the only data around. And, and so we kind of used it knowing that it wasn't the best source, but it's the best we had. And what this was able to do is give us was the proportion of contribution from each country in terms of users. So if one quarter of the world's users come from Absurdistan or somewhere, right, some mythical country, and only an eighth of the ads are from the same country, then if you want to even things up, you have to double the weight you gave to the ads that were in that country to match the underlying population. You had to correct for ad bias. And I think for a considerable period of time, and quite possibly even today, this was the only measure that was overtly doing any kind of weighting adjustment to account for that social disparity. Well, I think no one else was actually doing the kind of ad-based measurement we were doing. I don't think they encountered this problem. But when you want to talk about all of the internet and all of the users, you have to confront this one way or another because wherever you look is biased and however you look is biased. And if you're trying to get over that and say, well, irrespective of me and my measurement, what can I say about the thing that I'm measuring? You have to understand those biases and account for them. Something you did early on in our presentation of this data in labs is you did an integration of the data collection with knowledge you had about origin AS for prefixes. And you started to compile a view of the information, who's doing six as users, that related to the AS that was providing the address. Ah, you see, this is this thing about ads. And in fact, it's this thing about the internet and part of the issue that we had. The internet can be incredibly slow, although for people listening today, you go, what, really? It's just so lightning fast. Um, But of a day and age before content distribution networks, et cetera, it could be incredibly slow. And the way we speeded things up was with middleware, with caches, with things that listened and then replayed what they heard when someone else asked for it. So rather than always going back to the primary source, you you tried to intermediate content and and serve locally. Yeah. The problem was that if you're trying to do a measurement about what end users are doing, you're not interested in a measurement about what caches do. You don't want the cache getting in the way. So the first thing we had to do was to make sure, and this is actually harder than it sounds, that every single URL was unique. But oddly enough, that was a liberating thought because every domain name needed to be unique. And we thought, well, gee, what can we put in the domain name that makes it unique but tells us stuff? And so one of the early things we did was we encoded the time. So it's not www.labs.something. It's um, 167258-3205. Those complicated URLs you see everyone else doing, we started doing it too, but we're encoding the time. Yeah. And then we started to think about this a little bit, and we thought, you know, you can actually treat these URLs as microcode. These are mini programs. So if I want to deliver a V6 only thing to you, why don't I use a URL that starts with the two characters, V6, for example? Yeah. V4, I can start with V4. If I want DNS with a certain behavior, I can go DNS1 or 2 and name the behaviors and just stuff it into the URL. And interestingly then, what you find is this elastic view where what we thought was static, everything is microcode, and what we're building in the servers were these microcode engines. You've arrived at a place that had the early version the hack that I came (laughs) up with, and the later version when you went and found smarter people to do it better. 
Might I mention, do you credit Ray Bellis? Thank you very much. Brilliant piece of code, mate. Yeah. The early version, I said, Jeff, I'll fix this for you. I'll make a giant DNS bind configuration that pre-populates 100,000 of these labels. And you said, great, yeah. make it so. And so I scripted making the DNS run in bind, which took somewhere around five minutes to start up and then sat there. And for quite a while, for quite a few months, this actually worked okay. But I remember you coming back and saying, the problem is, George, we're doing too many ads and 100,000 isn't going to cut it. And so I said, well, I can't make a zone big enough for this, Jeff, because it'll take a day to reload. This isn't going to work. And that's where Ray Bellis entered the room, because in conversation, you effectively brought Ray to say, why are you pre-making statically a web file when a program could emit the state of the DNS for you? Why don't you turn the DNS server from a database lookup into a straight up compute? Because the answer is always the same. It's just an A address and a quad A address. And if all you're doing is delivering an answer, why don't you just do this with a piece of stateless code? And sort of, wow. I needed to be hit with that clue by four, and you hit me. Yeah. By the way, you seem very interested in this. Do you want to help us with some code? And obligingly, Ray went, oh, yeah. Eternally grateful. Great piece of work. So the DNS we were running before Ray did that coding, probably had about a 5 to 10% drop rate in UDP because it was just basically overloaded and couldn't respond. It was stressed out, yeah. After Ray wrote that code, our presentation rate tripled and doubled again and doubled again, and the DNS side didn't bat an eyelid. Well, and we're now getting to the point about trying to increase, if you will, the the granularity of this, it was like the sort of evolution of digital cameras from, you know, 100 pixels to 100 megapixels took some time. But each time you increase the density of pixels in the camera, you got a better picture. So we started upping the ad rate. And now that we had dynamic machinery that seemed to be able to scale, we were doing ever larger counts of ad impressions, which was starting to cost us just a wee bit. And I remember going over to Google, to Vinsurf, going, I think we're all interested in six, and I really am stressing out everything here over at my side. Can you help us? And then generously said, you know, yes, we can help in this work because public data about the internet from the perspective of the users is valuable to literally everybody. And our compact, I suppose, was no personal data is revealed, but the data is always available absolutely to everyone. There's, there's no caveats. We're not selling this. This is public data. And so their support has been absolutely brilliant ever since. So again, my thanks to them. But yes, this sort of became then, I suppose, a really useful instrument because this is one of the few times you can see the internet the way users see the internet. You see, if you look at BGP, you see the internet from the view of the routing protocol. That's pretty biased, might I add. If you see the view of the internet from the web server, you're seeing it from the inside looking out. And those eyes, that perspective, is the wrong way around. I remember a measurement being done about V6 extension header drop rate. And the only way the researcher could get this done was to actually bombard web servers with doctored packets that had this to see if the web server would answer. Incoming traffic in terms of the web server, that's actually not the real problem. The problem is the response from the web server. The view from the web server back to the user is important because that's where all the traffic is. And so bending the experiments round to see the world from the perspective of the user was actually the unique contribution. And to be perfectly frank, I think the true value of this it sees the network the way you and I use and see the network too. And this is now, we're talking something that is capable of collecting of the order 10 to 15 million samples a day worldwide. Yeah, more. 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 20? More. More. <laughs> and okay, if we, we overachieve. <laughs> if, we, if we consider an internet as being plausibly 
two to two and a half billion connected users, but substantively five to 600 million people online most of the time. A sample set that is measured in terms of 20 or 30 million is a highly representative sample. It's pretty representative. But the other part about ads too, and if you've noticed it, you don't generally get repeats. The advertiser tries very, very hard to sort of give every ad a fair run across the entire user base. So the collection of 25 million vote we collect on day one is not the same 25 million on day two, which they try and make not the same on day three. Now, these are big numbers. You will get some repeats, but it tends to sort of give you a cross section of everything everywhere, which we couldn't do with web, which we couldn't do with any other form of more static measurement where you end up measuring the same old thing every day, we're actually sampling almost every eyeball on the planet. I'm pretty sure we've seen our ads sometime somewhere because you just can't escape it. We've done how did it work. We've done how did it grow. We've done how did it avoid the pitfalls of a single point of measure, and we've done scale. And I feel a bit like who, why, what. We've arrived at what. What are you measuring? Because this started from a motivation of V6. You've brought DNS to the table and magic DNS labels, and you've discussed being able to look at some things like EH. So what kinds of things are being tested? We started with V6, and it was kind of interesting because don't forget, down at the other end of the ad, the browser, you actually don't see it. You cannot program it other than to get this URL, and you don't know if it actually did get it. You don't know if it tried and failed, because when you say get this V6 URL, you can see the ones that succeed, but you can't see the ones that fail because there's no V6 or because I moved to a different web page because that ad was boring or any other kinds of reasons. So that's you, the person collecting the data, can't see it because it's essentially the missing element in your log. Right. I have no contact with that end machine other than it did a get from me, and I don't know how reliable that was. So the first thing to note about the V6 ad was you have to measure what's not there. You have to measure the attempts to run V6 that failed, but you know they attempted it. Yeah. So we do control. It's the classic, you have a control experiment that always works, and then you have the one that you're interested in because you're looking for what failed. Yeah. So we actually use a dual stack URL, which we think will always answer. V4, V6, knock yourself out. If I see you asking for that URL from my server, big tick, count one. Now, I also, because I didn't just get you to get one thing, I got you to get a number of things. And the next thing I got you to get, not in sequence because browsers are their own rule, but I did go ahead and get you a V6 only. Yeah. So if you got the V4 dual stack in V4 and you didn't get V6, then I think I count you as a not V6 person. Yeah. If you used V6 to get dual stack and I still didn't see your V6, I count you as an errant person, but I did see you in six. So you're still a tick. Yeah. And if you got both using six, you're a tick. But hang on a second. What if you got the dual stack one in four and the V6 only one using six? What does that mean? Well, that's really, again, interesting. And we're actually starting to look at this again because that situation is visible right now today in Mongolia and right now today in China. So these are people who, if they're faced with a choice in a dual stack, wind up preferring four, but if they're told you can only come here on six, they do they'll it. say fine, and they'll get it on six. But we're programmed, the world's Androids, the world's Linuxes, the world's iOS, to say, if you've got a choice, you use six, because that's all part of the transition. The transition says in dual stack, gravitate towards six, it makes it go faster. It's not an open choice. There's a 50 millisecond timer flying around inside all this. And what it's really saying is the path inside your networks that resolve the six name and do the six path is slower, 50 milliseconds slower at least, than the total path around V4, and it exposes a second order of problems around V6 engineering. And as we touched upon earlier, I don't just do countries. I do networks as well. 
The network that gave you the service is your, quote, origin AS. I can use the BGP routing table. We know who your home network is. Yeah. And so these problems can be used as diagnostics pretty easily. But the key factor is you're looking for stuff that isn't there, stuff that should be there, getting it in V6, yeah. and it's when you can't that it's interesting. So along came the next problem because the V6 transition is interesting, but it's not the only one. And we thought there's an awful lot of work about getting security in the DNS, DNSSEC. And there's an awful lot of uncertainty about how much there is because if there's anything we know about the DNS, the first thing we know is we know nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Yeah. How many domain names are there? Bard will tell you the answer will be wrong. How big is the DNS? Well, it's kind of big. How yeah. many queries are there? A few. So the hidden story here is that with a machine that will generate 15 to 20 million events of someone trying to do things, and the only way they do it is that they're given a URL to fetch, every URL has a DNS lookup behind it. Right. It's a DNS and a web. And so for V6, we were looking at the web. And then we turned our attention to, you know that DNS thing? We can play with this. We now have this dynamic DNS server. We now have a server that can kind of answer on demand. Can we synthesize a signed, a DNSSEC signed domain on demand within the standard turnaround times of being a DNS server? Well, thank you, Ray Bellis. The answer is yes. <laughs> this is actually part and parcel of services like Cloudflare operating on your behalf. They do sign on the fly. So the DNS model kind of encompassed being able to do this. Right. And we were synthesizing wildcards without wildcards. It was a real name. And we were giving the impression back that this is a real name in a real subdomain with a real signature. Yeah. And when you tried to validate, it worked unless. So again, we gave two, the control and the test. Now, the control is, yeah, it's signed. It's really signed. It's genuinely signed. It all works. And the test was, you know that signature? We changed one bit. This will not validate. This is a bad signature. I remember some conversations that you actually have to be quite smart how you corrupt that signature string because there are <laughs> yeah. right and wrong places to change in it. And getting someone in software to deliberately craft a badly formed signature is a bit of a head-scratcher moment. It is. It is. We did manage to find it, and we did it. So then again, and the DNS is interesting because the signal for validation failure is, well, I failed, but I'm not the only resolver that you have at your disposal. You might like to try my brethren resolver. And they keep thrashing around and thrashing around. And when you create an invalidly signed domain name, it queries up to seven or eight times a lot of the time yeah. just to make sure that really is a dad. Which also represents a piece of measurement information. You have just uncovered that that cohort of users has a list of DNS resolvers behind it. Right. It has a list of resolvers, which we also then started to look at. And it also has thrashing behavior. So when you stuff up your DNS with DNSSEC, expect a whole lot more traffic because all those resolvers then start to beat you up because you might just give a good answer somewhere, somehow, because the error codes we were using at the time, and still most folk are using the old error codes, say, look, it may not be me. You might try someone else, but I can't give you an answer. Yeah. So as for V6, where you have this model of can do it, does do it, will do it, won't do it, for DNSSEC, you sort of have a multiplicity of potential states, don't you? Right, because you're kind of going, I'll class you as validating. If all of your resolvers don't go there. So you might have two, you might have three, you might be crazy and have 20. Don't go to a provable lie. Don't resolve this name because it's a lie. And if all of your resolvers don't resolve, you're behind one of these, you're validating. If even one of them resolve, you'll go there. You will go there. And it's kind of, Anyone that doesn't do it means yeah. you needn't have bothered with any of them. You know, you need. So we actually do three measurements. The folk who don't validate at all, we can't see any evidence. They don't ask the magic queries to our server. 
The folk who do, they get the control they don't get. They don't get the one that's invalidly signed. And we see the queries. We see the queries for the, the keys. And there's the third group that make the right queries to this badly signed domain. So they look as if they're validating. Then they go and resolve the name anyway and get the URL. Damn. And that's the mixed lot. And interestingly, 30% of the world's users sit behind DNSSEC validated resolver, yeah. which is an amazingly good number, much higher than we thought. And another 8% or so kind of go, yeah, but no. Yeah, but no. That might be invalid. But when I ask this other resolver that doesn't validate, I get the answer I want. So, you know, all's good. So you've done IPv6, you've done DNSSEC. And then we start to look at the resolver you're using. Because you see, the big thing about DNSSEC and the thing that sort of changed the dial was that the Google All 8s, the Google Public Resolver, did validation. And there was kind of this theory that a whole lot of people were using Google. And this 30% number was actually due to the use of Google's public DNS. It wasn't actually the rest of the world's ISPs doing anything. It was just a whole bunch of users were going, ah, oh, no, no, no. I'm using Google. I'm going to 8.8.8. Censorship, quality, performance, who knows, you know, reasons. So measuring the relativities of use of public DNS servers actually becomes information about well, the landscape. When a recursive resolver asks our authoritative servers a question, we now see you. Your IP address is sort of, hello, you're using Google. You're using Cloudflare. You're using your ISP's resolver. We know which resolver you're using. And what we did was go look at the backwards. What's the market share of Google? How many users sort of confide their DNS secrets with Google, with Cloudflare, or with any of these other open resolvers? And we started to actually expose the true market share of these people. And then we started to do something kind of fascinating, which was you look at the time of day in the home network, and what we noticed was that Google is used during work days, work hours, and less in the evenings, prime time, everything else, and on the weekends. And it seemed to us that we could make a pretty clear case that enterprise networks don't use the default DNS infrastructure. They tend to gravitate towards yeah. the open resolvers, whereas you and I on our mobile phones, yeah, just simply go, oh, well, whatever the ISP said, we'll use that. Yep. No one twiddled with the knobs because you might break it. And again, an interesting observation. And it certainly informed the process. What is Google up to with, with Google DNS? And where are they big? And where aren't they? And what does this mean? And in some ways, it had a bigger dimension than I had thought. Because you're a sovereign country you know, Tasmania, the nation of Tasmania. And, and you, you kind of find that 80% of your population are referring all their secrets and all their DNS to a resolver run by an American behemoth. It has no relationship with you and your government. Yeah. No rules, no nothing. And you kind of think, you know, I don't feel terribly comfortable about that. I don't want my... Yep, there are public policy implications from this. I don't want my critical national infrastructure being run by someone that is no relationship with me. They're a Martian. They're from somewhere else. This idea of good sign, bad sign actually translates quite cleanly to RPKI, the Protected BGP Announcement Framework. Oh, right. So, so again, the next measurement. So you move away from sort of the areas around let's look at this from a slightly geopolitical context and get back into how's technology doing. And we've certainly been tracking, and this one, I must admit, is much more challenging, tracking the adoption of BGP routing security. Same technique. You set up something that has a really bad rower. This is evil. Someone's been diddling. And one part of the ad says, go fetch a URL from that space. And the DNS leads you to this address. The address leads you to the routing system. The routing system says, well, that's a really bad route because it's not valid if you're using RPKI. And if everyone was running RPKI, no one would go there. If no one was running it, everybody would go there. Yeah. And obviously, it's the internet. You get a number in between. Yeah. And it would be nice to think, a bit like DNSSEC, that if you're a customer of Jeff's favorite ISP and you can't get 
this invalid rower, then Jeff's doing a great job. But no, it's routing. And the second law after everything is the DNS is BGP is not what she thought it was. Yeah. Because in some ways, it's nothing to do with Jeff necessarily. I have these number of vantage points that have an invalid sort of routing point. And what it really says is the path, the routing path between where the ad was impressed and where the bad route actually exists, you know, where the origin is, yep. has someone doing dropping. And Jeff might be lazy. He just might be relying on his upstream. Yep. There might be a default or an implicit uh, or acquired default, yeah, which is influencing the routing. So we can't solve that problem with ads. But we were working very, very hard to use different forms of what I would call Nurgle trace route to try and sort of surround this point yeah. with probes to see if we can isolate which network drops in balance. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't give you a bright, shiny web page because I haven't finished the work yet. It's a bit of a challenge. We'll put some link up to the various sources of information that stem out of this measurement technique in the blog that goes with the podcast. It's been brilliant. There's this new transport protocol called Quick, which I think we've talked about, right? Yep. Quick is brilliant. How much the world uses Quick? I don't know. I can't see your traffic just as well. How much the world could use Quick? Yeah. Aha. Can. You've just asked me a question. Yes. Because when you talk about capability, I can see to the conditions in the ad and the server to go, try Quick. If you can use Quick, I'll tickle it out of you. Yeah. Let's see if you do it. And although about 30% of the world's traffic, according to Cloudflare Radar, uses Quick, the real number is up around 65 to 70% can use Quick. And there's not a country in the world where it's blocked at that kind of national level anymore. Hmm. And, and even Ethiopia and Iran actually did appear to have national blocks, lifted them in the past few weeks. Yeah. And literally, quick is everywhere. And there's an awful lot of it. We've been looking at DNS over TLS, DNS over HTTPS. The amount of stuff that's amenable to this, yep. looking at what technologies can the user sort of cope with. EH headers. Oh, this, the whole V6 thing. RTT. Uh, You've been looking time, at all kinds of things. Connection loss rates, the quality of performance. And even now, yep. I'm delving into areas of, how slow is your DNS? And oddly enough, using techniques that isolate the DNS, and I think we've written about glueless DNS resolution, you can kind of expose this behavior and get it measured in the ad. So this has kind of been a 10-year odyssey of just taking a very simple approach. Make the ad resolve a URL, resolve a DNS name and fetch a URL, and control the behavior from the other end and just measure like crazy. And all of a sudden comes some rich and deep insights into how are we going? Is the internet working for everyone? What bits are going well? What bits need attention? Yeah. And I think that's been really valuable for everybody. And I get really chuffed when I see a presentation at AP Nick at one of these meetings and it's our slide, it's our stats. And I go, yay, thank you, thank yeah. you. There's more than a few doing it. I think it's been a really substantive contribution to understanding the nature of a global network. Unlike measure myself approaches, the naive approach, and unlike I'm going to put boxes in the network and measure behavior at a number of points, this one is at scale. Yes, but what really happens inside these devices, inside a phone, inside a browser, real users, real lived experience, that's what you're measuring. Right. It's the interaction of the device with the local network infrastructure with the services they use. And uh, I still think there's a long, long way to go. We haven't even touched the surface of peering under the hood with content data networks. But, you know, we could. And uh, there are certainly yeah. some possibilities that I'd like to, to chase forward. Watch this space, <laughs> folks. Jeff, that's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you for sharing some of that underlying technology and explaining just how this beast works. That's been great. A pleasure, George, and thank you, listener, for bearing with us. It's been fun. Thanks a lot. If you've got a story or research to share here on Ping, why not get in contact by email, ping at apnic.net or via the APNIC social media channels. 
Also, remember the measurement at apnic.net mailing list on Orbit is there to discuss and share relevant collaborative opportunities, grants and funding opportunities, jobs and graduate placings, or to seek feedback from the community on your own measurement projects. Be sure to check out the APNIC website for all your resource and community needs. Until next time.